Coming up on Tech Thing, seriously, does the Echo really need a screen? Build recommendations for Adobe Premiere and Creative Cloud, Proton VPN reviewed, and how can you make a VPN run faster? All that and more coming up on Tech Thing. Thank you, patrons. Without your support via patreon.com slash tech thing, we wouldn't be able to make the show for you each and every week. Please join the crew that makes tech thing possible at patreon.com slash tech thing. I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm Patrick Norton. And this is Tech Thing, where we have something useful in every single show. I'm going to give you a warning, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> okay. Prime Day is coming. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> Prime Day is coming up on July 11th, mm -hmm. and up until then, every single day, they have different uh, sales. So starting on July 5th, you can get different deals through mm -hmm. the Amazon Echo family up until July 11th, and um, hopefully they're good deals. If you find a good deal for you, fantastic. Something you may want to, there's a wonderful article on the wire cutter, Amazon Prime Day 2017, what to expect and how to find the best deals. And I point this one out because <laughs> in 2016, they looked at like, I want to say, 7,960 deals, nearly 8,000 deals, and they found 64 oh, worth posting. Wow. <laughs> which is a polite way of saying a lot of the stuff on Amazon Prime, that, you know, it's not necessarily bad, although it may be crap, but there's lots of crap <laughs> every day on Amazon. True. Um, but one of your friends in this situation is Camel, Camel, Camel. Um, I typed in a, a URL, basically drop the URL for whatever you're looking for or the keywords up here, and you get this awesome thing, which is yes. a price chart. This is our TCL 55 inch 4K Ultra HD Roku Smart LED TV 2017 model. And you'll notice how the price started at 600 and then almost immediately dropped down to 500 and has since dropped down to like 470, 450, 449.99. What you don't want to see is like July 10th is this price going back up. Um, right. <laughs> you know, or even and worse. listed as a prime deal. Yeah, and I'm not trying to call out TCL because they're making fantastic TVs and they're doing good stuff and, and Robert Heron loves what they're doing and, and I love what they're doing, but there just happened to be a link that came up. Yeah. Check Camel 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 because you might find that some items are at their regular or even higher. Mm -hmm. than the regular Amazon price. It's true. So speaking of Amazon, uh, we just happened to get an Echo Show. So I pre-ordered this and they just started shipping last week. Mm -hmm. uh, these online, they cost $229.99 and there's a couple of different color options. You can either get the black one, which is the one I have, or the white one. And weirdly enough, the white one still has that black bezel and the speaker grill on very, the front. So very stylish choice. Uh, it's like it's a penguin. It's not very sleek. It's like a penguin. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it is. <laughs> I guess if, if you're putting on a, like if you had like a console table behind your couch and maybe, the, I don't know, it's, it, they obviously didn't want to produce. I think the black one is sleeker. So the first thing I noticed about this, other than the color choices, was that it looks extremely like a CRT monitor, like a little miniature CRT monitor. Well, it is a little miniature CRT monitor. Yeah, pretty much. With it an also echo looks, inside. Have you, are you familiar with the Chumbi? <laughs> Back Sadly, in the day, I, Me well, too. I used was to a, have one. It was a very early Internet of Things device. And it, was. it was like a screen in yeah. a pillow that you carried around your house. Yep, and it would read like <laughs> RSS feeds and things like that. It so was glorious. So this reminds me of a Chumbi. So the screen on it is a 1024 by 600 resolution screen. So it's not amazing by any standard. It's fine though for an e yeah. screen. Yeah, it's it's fine. I mean, that's pretty much all you need if you're mm -hmm. just looking at information showing up on the screen, and you don't really need it to you know watch 4K videos or something like. <laughs> that. Uh, so the point of the Echo Show is to bring a monitor into your home space so that you can see things as well as hear them. So this also brings a feature called video calling into the Echo family. So other show owners or other Echo app users can video call you via Wi-Fi, not over carriers or anything. Like you and the other thousand Echo owners. Oh, wait. So there's the app you can run on your phone. <laughs> Sorry, I was like, yes. the first time I heard that, I'm like, oh, that's a small knit group. But. Yeah, but you can use it with the app too. Okay. So Echo or Echo Dots can make voice calls with you over this, or um, other Echo and Echo Dots can also voice call each other. Now, if you are doing a video call, the mm -hmm. webcam on the front of this is five megapixels, which is fine. It's very right. similar to a laptop webcam, so no difference there. Uh, when I did some test calls, they were very clear. I had very little lag. With that said, though, I was on the same Wi-Fi connection as mm -hmm. the person that I was calling through their app. So 
If you're on different network connections, you might have issues, but right. I didn't test that. Um, I didn't have any buffering issues or anything like that, so your mileage may vary, of course. Now, calling privacy concerns. I did have a few of those, and I wanted to mention them because they're important to me. So when you approve contacts in the Echo app, it automatically populates a list from your phone's contacts of people that own Echo devices. So you automatically get to know who owns an Echo device. And I feel a little skeptical. So it didn't, you didn't have a, it was basically an all or none situation. Yeah, it's an all or none situation where anybody in your contacts that has an Echo device, you get to see them. You get you get to know automatically who has an Echo device from your contacts. I don't feel super comfortable letting everybody in my mm -hmm. contact list know that I have an Echo device because I also have like a lot of PR contacts and stuff like that in my contact well, list. Well, couldn't I mean just because Me. they're listed in the they have you now listed in their contacts? Does right. that mean they can automatically call you up? Whether I'm going to mention that, so <laughs> you can then click on a person's name or call them via voice or you can text them. Mm -hmm. uh, you can choose to allow them to drop in anytime. Mm -hmm. You have to allow that, uh, which means that you don't have to pick up, but each contact is defaulted to off on that drop in option. Uh, anyone who has you listed as a contact can then call you as well if they have your number saved they will see your number in the application as well. Okay. So keep that in mind. But they probably already have your number if you're in their contacts. So drop-in is defaulted to on for the whole list. Really? Then you separately grant permission to each contact. So if you have, say... What I mean by that is drop-in is defaulted as an option, as a setting for your your devices on, but you have to go into each contact separately okay. and allow it, them to drop in. Okay, because the first time I heard that, I was yeah. like, wait a minute, all 700 <laughs> well, contacts. There's the clarification. Okay. So you can also choose only my household or off as options for that drop in so that they're off completely or just people from your uh, mm -hmm. household can drop in then, which could be useful for a family. Right. But for me, it's just me and my husband and then like two cats. <laughs> so I don't necessarily want to turn that on for anybody. Like I don't want my friends just dropping in on my house. That's creepy. <laughs> I, or may it be enjoyable <laughs> and delightful perhaps. It might you know, for grandparents and grandchildren. Right, so in the case of me where I have a bunch of PR contacts in my contact list, right. I can also block contacts, contacts separately. So I can go through my list and I can block somebody mm -hmm. and they'll never be able to contact me through this Echo device. Uh, you have to call customer service as well if you want to deregister from the voice calling and messaging service, so which is really irritating. If you don't want to show up on everybody's Echo because you don't plan yeah. to ever use that service on here. You have to call them. It's just like getting off of Comcast internet. <laughs> it's just like it. Can't yeah. do it on the website. They Call make it, the 800 They number. make it extremely irritating to deregister your device from that ability. I, I feel like they just want everybody to use that. And for me, well, I'm just like, do. I don't want to use that. I They're really Amazon. just want to default it off. So they salivate. that's I mean, annoying. They just want a Google <laughs> level of insertion into all of your communications. <laughs> Apparently so. So moving on from that with the device itself, the show has a volume up and down button and a power button on the top. The power button can also mute your microphone and disable your webcam completely. In the settings, there is also this do not disturb mode, which is pretty cool. It darkens the screen and it turns off notifications except for timers and alarms. So mm -hmm. if you want to use this as an alarm or as a clock next to your your, your uh, bed, for example, right. you could do that and just use the do not disturb option. Uh, the speaker on here gets very loud and it is better quality, like I mentioned, than the original Echo. Uh, not the Echo Dot though, that one's pretty terrible, <laughs> to be honest. But <laughs> the Echo Dot is pretty bad, but the, the original Echo is definitely still better than the Echo Dot. And the screen gets rather bright. So if you don't use Do Not Disturb, I would not recommend setting this next to your bed because it gets very bright and it will turn on whenever it sees movement or motion. <laughs> so settings also allow for restricting access to certain applications, like I can turn off uh, on restricted access into YouTube. That's defaulted to right. on, so I had to turn it off. I had to type in my like 40 character random generated password into this thing, which was the most irritating actually, thing ever. I'm actually, having children, I can totally see where that would be useful to have a lot of yes, that stuff. Because you don't want your kids to be like, mom and dad won't let me watch Prime in yeah. the you know, living room, but I can just sneak into their bedroom and watch it on the... <laughs> nope. Yeah. <laughs> and then you can also do things like change themes. You can make like your photos show mm -hmm. up instead of a cool little background like I have right now. Uh, this Echo uses the same Q&A type voice dialogue, but it gives you visuals to go along with the answers. So for example, if I say, 
What is the weather in Richmond, California? In Richmond, California, it's 67 degrees with partly sunny skies. Yay! Today, you can look for intermittent clouds with a high of 73 degrees and a low of 56 degrees. Cool! So it's going to give me some nice visuals to go along mm -hmm. with that data, just in case I'm a visual learner, for example. So it shows me that weather data, it shows me song lyrics if I want it to, it'll show me a YouTube video, for example, it'll show you text for answers, or you can look at your to-do list and your shopping list and you can edit them on the screen too. Mm -hmm. You can also touch the screen to do things like scroll through a list, you can delete those list items, you can swipe through your weather data, or you can play and pause a YouTube video as well. Uh, since it does work with the smart home, devices, it will also show you security camera footage from, for example, a Ring device. Oh, nice. Unfortunately, it does not work with my Canary, which is very sad. <laughs> if it did, though, I would totally want to keep this forever because that would be really cool. Now, each time you do something on the show, it will chill on that screen till you say to go home or you wait. Put it where? Okay, so. Yeah, so it, you have to wait several seconds before okay. it actually goes home all the way. So keep that in mind. Uh, there is no Netflix video, there's n just Amazon and there's just YouTube. Uh, there is no search functionality for searching mu music or videos. You just kind of have to know the name off the top of your head or you have to figure out what you should search for to find that thing. Alexa, play Clutch Green Buckets. Green Buckets by Clutch. It found it. Alexa, pause. Cool. So it found it. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> But so luckily as long you, as you know exactly case. what you want. Yeah, because you can't okay. search for it. Uh, there is no audio out. You can't adjust the webcam or the screen. So if you want to tilt it back and forth, mm -hmm. you got to stick it on a book or something because you can't do it in the actual device itself. There's no internal battery, so you have to keep it plugged in. But mm -hmm. luckily, the cable is quite long. You can't turn off the screen completely, like I mentioned earlier. And if it senses that right. motion, it will turn on automatically and stay on. I wish I could add custom apps, too, to the home screen because currently, you don't have that that option. It'll just show up, show you whatever it feels like showing you. Like for mine, it shows me my uh, my schedule right. and it shows me uh, questions that I can ask the X Echo, for example. Well, it also shows like the Hack 5 RSS feed. Yeah, exactly. About. So I already have an original Echo. I'm very happy with it. And since this one comes with the same functionality and I'm kind of leery about adding a webcam to my house, I can't necessarily warrant purchasing this one as an upgrade right. to the original Echo, unless you want that better speaker and you do want the webcam. But if you want the screen, if you want the calling functionality, it could be very useful for families, like you mentioned earlier, then it could be, it probably is the best option right now. But for me, it's not the option. It's not that, unless you are really in love with the screen right. and the, the face, the, the video calling, right. it's not a particular upgrade over the Echo. Exactly. Well, so, except for the speakers. Yeah, except for the speaker. So if, if you're <laughs> satisfied with the speaker on the original one, you don't want the webcam or the screen, just stick with the original. You don't need to upgrade. AskTechThing.com, people. Best place to get a hold of us to ask your questions. We're waiting to hear. We got a message from June who writes, Hello, Patrick and Shannon. I am looking to build a PC to do video editing and rendering. I will use Adobe Premiere, Photoshop, and After Effects. I need your recommendation. Thanks in advance. Love the show. June from Los Angeles, California. Oh, boy. Um, oh, boy. So this is one of those things where you can spend almost an unlimited amount on a PC build. Yeah. This all depends on what your budget is. Seriously. <laughs> Multi-core CPU, loads of memory, giant SSDs, a solid GPU, all of them work together to make Adobe's Creative Cloud, which includes Premiere and After Effects and all the other good Adobe stuff, uh, operate at its best. You can overspend <coughs> Xeon CPUs. Oh, yes, <laughs> sorry. But you can also pretty easily spend a couple grand on a solid uh, editing and After Effects machine. Mm -hmm. um, if you go into the Adobe Premiere CC system requirements, these are a start. They're um, a start. They're a start. Yeah. Really, they are the minimum. Let yeah. me be clear about that. For example, eight gigabytes of RAM. It will nope. run Adobe Premiere. You will not enjoy the process. That's why they say 16 gigs or more recommended. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, they don't do a really good job of kind of getting into what you want for a good basic system. So. Right. I'm going to say it right out. It, it really depends on your budget. You want the best CPU you can afford, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you can, get at least a, uh, an eight-core 
uh, Core i7 or AMD Ryzen. Um, eight or 10 cores max is about as much as Premiere seems to be able to handle. So unless you're doing some crazy multitasking, yeah. um, those should be more than enough. 16 gigabytes of RAM minimum. Yes. A one terabyte <laughs> uh, solid state drive if you can swing it. And then the VME SSD would be an excellent idea, again, if you can afford it. Yeah. You'll also want a big, cheap hard drive for storing stuff when you're done. And a 1070 GPU is a solid place to start, although oh, there yes. are less expensive GPUs that will do the job. Before you dump all of the money for your mortgage or <laughs> your, your meal money for the semester, concentrate on CPU, RAM, and storage. Those are the three things that will destroy you. Then build out the rest over time as mm -hmm. your budget permits, assuming you're on a budget. One of the only places I've seen doing a lot of really good job testing and analyzing what makes a good uh, Premier system, uh, Puget Systems, uh, great people. Um, I've looked at some of their boxes in the past. They've done some really nice research on machines for Creative Cloud. Um, and they've done a really nice FAQ and they've done oh, a wow. lot of testing. So, you know, they point out Premiere Pro does a decent job utilizing multiple CPU cores, I'm quoting here, but there is a steep drop in performance gains after around eight to 10 CPU cores. And huh. like I said before, just don't even bother with Xeon at this point. <laughs> you don't really need it. Yeah, as a general rule of thumb, Puget System says, we recommend 32 gigabytes if you work with 1080p footage, mm -hmm. 64 gigabytes of RAM for 4K footage, 128 gigabytes of RAM for 6K footage, and 258 gigabytes or more if you work with 8K footage. Which we're going to assume that you're not. <laughs> so you don't need that much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, most of the people I know are still just optimizing for 4K video. Right. Most yeah. people I know still shoot and edit in 1080p. Yep. Um, Puget's also done a bunch of video card testing, too. It's amazing how much performance uh, you get out of a GTX 1070 compared to a $1,000 Titan X. Wow. So if you scroll down here, 100% is the uh, Titan XP 12 gigabytes and 82% uh, of that performance, 82.3% oh. of that performance you're getting out of a GTX 1070, which costs less than half as much. Wow. Um, so props to PugetSystems.com for, for making that information available. And again, they're one of the only places that's done a ton of, of kind of benchmarking and testing. And they also, I think, work with a lot of people who are transitioning from OS 10 mm -hmm. to PCs for the first time. Side note, um, depending on whether this is like something you're doing for a wedding one time or something you're doing for a hobby or something mm -hmm. you're doing uh, all of the time, 10 hours a week, seven days a week, 10 hours a day, seven days a week, um, <laughs> you're gonna be spending hours standing at, uh, staring at a monitor. And I'm gonna say this for anybody buying a new monitor, 1080p monitor minimum, mm -hmm. uh, WQHD 2560 by 1440 uh, is a much better way to go. Yes, I can agree with yeah. all of that. <laughs> so. All of this information wants me to build a new editing PC for the studio. Oh yeah. But I don't need one at home because I, I have the uh, editing laptop at home, so. The editing laptop of yeah, joy. Yeah, which is surprisingly faster than the editing machine we have here in the studio. Well, it's much newer. It is and much also, newer. And also GPU performance, which is not everything in terms right. of uh, video editing performance, but GPU performance has taken a huge leap with the latest generation Ooh, of yes. GTX GPUs. So let us know if you have any questions about editing rigs, gaming rigs, <laughs> any kind of rigs, because we love <laughs> checking out that kind of information. You can email us, ask at techthing.com, or you can tweet us at techthing. Hey everybody, we got a new build video at patreon.com slash techthing. If you aren't already a patron, really, it's time to become one. You get access to our patron-only videos, an audio-only podcast feed, and at the $10 and higher level, monthly hangouts with Shannon and I. Again, patreon.com slash techthing. Help support the show. If you can't donate, we understand. Keep sending in your emails, and hey, if you could spare a moment or two to give our videos the thumbs up on YouTube, like our Facebook page, or review Tech Thing on iTunes or your favorite podcatcher, we would appreciate it. It all helps. Thank you so much for supporting Tech Thing, no matter how you do it. Quite a few people wanted us to know that Proton Mail, they're a security focused email provider based out of Switzerland, just introduced or, or, or took out a beta, the Proton mm -hmm. VPN. Um, they've been, I get that some of the Proton Mail subscribers mm -hmm. have been testing it out, and now Proton VPN is public. Yay! 
you went on a VPN testing rampage this weekend. Uh, pretty much, yeah, that's exactly what I did. <laughs> rampage. <laughs> so the cool things about Proton VPN is it's very, very much security focused. So a lot of people have been interested in this uh, even since before it was uh, made public. So they have this privacy-minded thing called Secure Core, which is a network of privacy-minded countries uh, that they tunnel their VPN traffic through, stating that your IP address won't be compromised even if something happened to the VPN. So that's a little that's a little marketing term it's, for what a, I a think a lot term. of VPNs do, <laughs> where they're like, what country will it take the largest number yeah. of decades of legal action to make that's us turn exactly over this is. stuff? <laughs> so. And of course, they charge you more for it, too. Other than that, they are Swiss-based as well. They don't log activity, and they use perfect forward secrecy with AES-256 encryption and open VPN protocols. Now, with that said, though, <laughs> I do also want to mention that OpenVPN recently had some flaws that they did patch, so keep that in mind. Anything can be hacked. Encryption is also done with AES-256 with 2048-bit key exchanges and SHA-256 for message authentication. So all the geeks out there would know what I mean. If you don't, check out Hack5. They also state that they have DNS leak prevention and a kill switch to block connections if the VPN gets dis disconnected. And that's something that I highly recommend you yeah. look for whenever you're choosing a VPN. So just in case something happens, it will disconnect you from the network whatsoever. That way, like, for example, if you're if you get disconnected and reconnect, you don't yeah. continue to download things yeah. in the clear or to transmit traffic in the clear despite the fact that your VPN is disconnected. It's exactly. a cool feature. <laughs> and keep in mind, as with any other VPN, you are putting some trust into that company to keep your data private. Right. I don't. I haven't seen the code for uh, Pro Proton VPN. I haven't seen the code for private internet access. Right. So I am giving them some trust whenever I decide to sign up for a VPN with that company. Yeah. Um, but they do have other perks as well. They have P2P support. They have unlimited bandwidth and 10 gigabit servers, nice. and up to 10 devices per account, depending on how much you choose to pay. Now I mentioned that before. Let's check out the pricing. There are a few different options. They have four different tiers, starting with the free option, and then it goes up from there. Um, this is 20% off annually, but if you check out the monthly prices, there we go. So it's five bucks a month, 10 bucks a month, and 30 bucks a month. And then you get that 20% off if you choose to do annually. Uh, the biggest differences with these are the free version has the lowest speeds. The Plus and Visionary options have five devices or 10 devices for themselves, highest speeds. They also come with Secure Core themselves. And if you choose Visionary, you get that free Proton Mail account uh, with the cost of your Proton VPN. Proton Mail Visionary. Yes, Visionary. <laughs> Ooh. So I ended up signing up for the basic plan, and mm -hmm. then I also tried the Pro plan or the Plus plan and the free plan just to see how the speeds changed depending on each one. So it was kind of interesting, actually. Really? Yeah, so they do have downloads available for pretty much every operating system. There's Windows, Mac, Linux, Android, and iOS. Sorry if you're using a Windows phone. They don't include you. So the client interface is actually very easy to use, and it's really, really nice. Uh, the GUI is lovely. I thought it was very simplistic. Uh, but with that said, they also have all the settings that you would need available to you, not only just in your for your account in your profile, but you also have things like this, where you can choose to default on that VPN kill switch, mm -hmm. or the DNS leak protection is automatically defaulted on, Good. which is great. Uh, and you can also create different profiles. So let's say that you're doing very specific uh, use cases for the different connections that you want to use with your VPN. You can create different profiles with different countries and different servers, and if you want to use Secure Core for each of those different profiles. Nice. Personally, I would just use one profile for everything because I don't feel the necessity to actually set up different profiles. You're just but not paranoid enough. Yeah, if you're paranoid <laughs> enough, you can totally set up separate profiles. Well, I told you, well, you might want to set up a profile if I want to access to Canadian websites that refuse to let curling oh, that's true, over the yeah. border. I might set up a Canadian one, a UK a one, point. a France one. If I'm testing various services yeah. or how various uh, you know firewalls are behaving in different countries. Exactly. So. So I know you're interested in the speed, so I'm yes. going to show show those uh, to you with some handy little graphics. <laughs> okay, so Plus and Visionary, mm -hmm. they give you a bunch more features, right? Yes. Take a look, or even Basic for that matter. 
you get the more devices, you get the secure core, um, which is fancy speak for more, more Tor privacy. Tor servers. You get Tor servers, yep. Were there really any speed differences between like Visionary and Plus and Basic when you did your, well you didn't test Visionary, but like Plus and Free in your testing? You know, surprisingly, not really. I mean, of course we're going to lose a little bit of speed because, you know, we're switching from our local Comcast server over to a VPN, so mm -hmm. we lose a little bit in upload and download. But when you compare Free versus Basic versus Plus, Unless you need more devices or unless you need right. that uh, um, extreme secure core. secure core, then I don't really see a difference in the speeds. It's very minimal. It was also interesting, I, you know, looking at the secure core, right? Because mm -hmm. it goes from here to Europe. Yeah. So you go from, I want to say, like 10 second ping times without right. VPN, 17 second ping times for US VPNs, and then like 300 and something to 500 and yeah. something millisecond <laughs> ping times. Well, because for the like Switzerland ones, yeah. You get this huge level of security, but your speeds are gonna drop right. because all of your packets are going, you know, from somewhere in Europe through their VPN back across the right. Atlantic to here in the United States. And that's States. going to happen with any VPN server that you choose to go with. But if you want to right. just stick with US servers and you don't mind like the 14 eyes, um, privacy issues with, you know, the 14 countries, then, then you know, you could stick with the U.S. ones and you will see very minimal decrease of right. speeds. Now, in the future, though, with um, any VPN provider, we may see a decrease of speeds even more as more people get tacked on to right. the, the company's servers. Or they may decide to provide better service or additional may, server yeah. points and yeah. or additional bandwidth and speeds may go up. Yeah, so of course with any VPN and any network uh, testing, your mileage will vary with VPNs too um, because of where you're located or because of where, which server that you right. choose to use. Uh, with my testing, I chose to go with the, the auto or the default options that they gave me. So they gave me the fastest speeds possible out of uh, Switzerland and also the fastest speeds possible out of the US. Okay. And that's what it, I was able to report on. Now, of course, I could try every single server <laughs> and give you those numbers, but you would be here all day. <laughs> so I just chose the auto ones because I'm, I'm assuming that that's what most people are going to choose. That seems reasonable to me. Yeah, I mean, free, you get three countries, one device. Yeah. Um, basic, you get all the countries to choose from and two devices. That's probably not a bad way to go. Don't yeah. expect a huge speed increase from plus. And also, since I do use PIA VPN uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, mm -hmm. the cost comparison between basic and PIA is very, very close. I think there's an $8 difference. So either one would probably do you quite well, especially right. since their speeds are very, very similar. $8 per year uh, or $8 per month? $8 per year would be the difference. That's practically nothing. Yeah, it's, it's a very <laughs> small amount. So let me know what you think if you have been using Proton VPN or Proton Mail for that matter, because uh, I do think it's a really, really cool service and I like the company and I'm totally all about supporting any companies that are all about privacy and security. Go privacy. Well, we're talking VPN performance. Benny, he wants his VPN to run faster and wrote asketechthing.com. I have been looking at VPN service for a while, being concerned about privacy, but as I have tested PIA, I'm not sure if it is regional, but my speed was not more than eight megabits per second, and I do have 35 megabit per second downloads. I tried servers in Denmark, where the distance should be minimal, Norway, Ireland, and Germany, but nowhere were the blazing speeds promised by almost all VPN providers. If I connect in Denmark and I select the nearest or let the program select by ping time, how come almost all VPN providers give me these ridiculously low speeds? Great show. Just recently found it as an add-on to Cody, Benny in Denmark. Yay! Yay! Thank you for watching the show. Really appreciate it. Yeah. So if you tried multiple servers, and you have Norway, Ireland, Germany, and if you tried more than one VPN, I would try at least two or three VPNs, and you still get the same eight megabits per second, I wonder if the problem is the machine running the encryption. So when you are setting, VPN requires encryption. Encryption is calculation intensive. Um, routers, NAS boxes, old Android phones, ancient PCs, older PCs, they all tend to choke on encryption and slow things down, especially if you're like, I want 4,000 bit encryption. I want. There is no. Well, there's. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, 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 you know, there's a certain point where, like, I get that people are like, I, you know, for example, 
you know, Proton VPN. Yeah. 200, and, I would say 2016, was it 2016 bit keys? Yeah. That's a giant key. Yeah, that's <laughs> like, that's like, you know, I want it to take several years for someone to calculate or to, you know, crack this, this, this bit of data. Um, there's a really good article up on uh, IVPN um, called My VPN is Slow, What Can I Do to Make It Faster? And there's a lot going on. You know, obviously you've tried changing servers. Um, changing between UDP and TCP are definitely an option. Mm. Using a wired connection in case the problem is actually your Wi-Fi connection. Um, again, we mentioned this, you know, switch devices to make, you know, if for example, if Benny, you set this up on your router, take it off your router, put it on your PC, uh, restart your modem or router, uh, try LTTP, IPsec, um, security software can be a problem, restarting your device can help. Um, you know, it's run a trace route to see if there's a particular mm, thing. Yeah. For example, if for some reason your ISP does not like VPN right. and they're detecting behavior they think is VPN-like, they could be throttling it there. Um, lots of good options up on there and we'll put that one in the show notes. But the big one is if you've tried a bunch of VPNs, you know, try, if they have options to sort of decrease the word length on the security, try that and see if your performance goes up. And if it does, it's definitely a device you're running the mm -hmm. VPN on. So you found a tweet from Robert that you were interested in, right? I was excited about this. You want cheaper lithium ion batteries. Always. I want cheaper lithium ion batteries. <laughs> and you want cheaper lithium ion batteries. As so long as they're still good quality. Uh, that's a big that's a big one there. Yeah. We'll get into that in a second. <laughs> so I was really excited when our buddy Robert sent out a tweet that said battery cost per kilowatt hour may fall faster than solar energy production. What? Yeah. Whoa. Well, yeah, and it's interesting that he tied it into solar energy production, but um, he linked to a tweet that links to a uh, Bloomberg. Bloomberg article. China is about to bury Elon Musk in batteries. Whoa. Well, this is an interesting thought, right? So the article talks about Tesla's Gigafactory that's coming online in 20, it's gonna be like right. fully online in 2018. Yeah. 35 gigawatt hours of batteries produced annually uh, by 2018. And the article claims that, quote, Chinese companies have plans for additional factories with the capacity to pump out more than 120 gigawatt hours per year by 2021. Whoa. Yeah. So roughly today, 55%, and this is again, I'm quoting the, the article on Bloomberg, roughly 55% of global lithium ion battery production is already based in China compared mm -hmm. to 10% in the US. And by 2021, if China brings all this capacity online, that would bring them to 65% of global production, which will be twice what global production currently is. Wow. So yeah, so that's, that's huge, Jeez. huge, huge increase. Um, that's mostly going to be <coughs> fueled by much greater or a, a massive increase in the production of electric cars. Mm -hmm. So having just done a build video around a 30 something pound lead acid battery, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm down with the increased production of lithium ion batteries and hopefully reduced prices. Um, and I've been saying that ever since like Tesla first announced, Elon Musk first announced that the Gigafactory is being built outside of Reno. It's exciting to me. What I thought was also interesting, I got a tweet from um, at Tech Help who said, solar pipe dream. I read somewhere that solar provides less than 0.01% of world power use. Cells get what? 18% efficiency at best? Question mark. Hmm. So when you're is looking that at- true? Well, so when you're looking at solar panel efficiency, I'd say 18% is probably generous, mm -hmm. uh, depending on you know, sort of what era of solar cell production you're looking at. Um, but when you realize that fairly mature technologies like coal, petroleum, gas, and nuclear generation are around 30% efficient, in that case, 18% oh, wow. doesn't sound too bad for a, a, a technology that is improving. I don't know what the cap on efficiency will be for solar energy, but remember, when you are being powered by the sun, which vomits energy onto the planet all the time, <laughs> right? You have a free and unlimited source of energy. And before anyone emails ask at techthing.com, I know the sun sets every day and the solar <laughs> cells become incredibly useless when the sun is down. I understand. Well, hopefully they store that energy. And that's where the whole battery reduction cost kind of comes in. Yeah. And yes, absolutely. Solar is a tiny percentage of global production. It's actually around 1% of global needs, not 0.01% mm. of global needs. Globally, solar capacity is growing fast. It grew by 50% in 2016 alone. Wow. The US and China both doubled their solar power production capacity in 2016. Wow. Which brings me to an awesome article up on the tree hugger. Check this out. 
Yeah, here in California, where the state has a goal of 33% of its energy coming from renewable sources by 2020 and 50% by 2030, we hug some trees out here. We do. Oh, yes. We also don't really have a whole lot of natural energy resources other than sun. We're a bit <laughs> ahead of the global curve. For one glorious day in March, half of our electricity came from solar. Wow. Okay, for about three hours on one glorious day in March this but year. But still, that's so cool. It is cool. It's, 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 it's exciting stuff. Most of that energy in California actually comes, um, you know, that generated that 50% of electricity mm -hmm. in the state. Like 40% of the, uh, or, or I want to say like the majority of that 50%, 40 of that 50% mm -hmm. comes from large scale solar power plants. Wow. Um, a lot of which are down in the southern part of the state, out in the desert, where they focus zillions of mirrors on boiling water on a giant, well, boiler on a stick. They're trippy to see. Only 10% of those currently come from rooftop systems on homes and businesses, but you gotta start somewhere. And I think that there are worse things in taking all of the energy that Saul dumps on the planet and capturing it. <laughs> I'm just saying. Agreed. <laughs> Unlimited source of energy, gonna burn for millions of years. We should be good at this point. Mm -hmm. um, one last thought before we go, check this out. The US is using so much solar power, this is up on Quartz Media, the U.S. is using so much solar power that it will actually have to prepare for the August eclipse. What? Yeah, not wow. by a lot, but basically, quote, with a solar eclipse due to sweep across the U.S. on August 24th, utility operators are preparing to guard against a steep drop in solar power. As the shadow of the moon passes over North America, the eclipse is expected to knock out about 70 megawatts a minute, two to three times faster than a typical daily drop, uh, and it's going to come back even faster. But uh, it's so funny. It's not unmanageable, but it has prompted U.S. utilities from California to North Carolina to look for a solution to a new problem, managing <laughs> grids increasingly <laughs> reliant on solar power. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, I That's get it. That's hilarious. Yeah, it is. It's, it, but it, the point is, is there is more so solar power than we think. Yeah. There is more solar power than you probably think in the U.S. and in China. It is probably growing at a faster rate than you think. And yes, it's still a tiny percentage of overall production, mm -hmm. but it is obviously having an impact and a particularly big impact uh, in California. <laughs> I guess it's a good thing we don't get more eclipses. <laughs> I guess it probably is a good thing. <laughs> this is like a Y2K bug. <laughs> oh my goodness. I look forward to the day where solar cells become so inexpensive that I can actually put them on the roof of my house yes. along with one of Tesla's crazy house batteries. Yes. And then I can generate all of my own electricity. And then hopefully someday I'll be able to afford an electric car. That would be nice. That you would know, save a lot of money. Electric motors, the torque curve is flat from zero to all the RPMs. Oh wow. It is glorious. Oh wow. <laughs> Remember ladies and gentlemen, once in a while put down the phone, step away from the screen, close the laptop and do something analog like my family and I did. Attend the inaugural Coast Guard Festival held by the Coasties of USCG Base Alameda. That was after Alameda's epic annual 4th of July parade, which is oh, like three fun. hours long. We have a huge 4th of July parade. It is Sounds awesome. awesome. <laughs> and uh, I want to give a special thanks to the commander and crew of the Coast Guard Cutter Aspen, a 225-foot seagoing buoy tender for being particularly generous and gracious to the swarms of people swarming over their boat. It was Aww. pretty, pretty cool. <laughs> we didn't make it onto the pike. They had one of the 87-foot uh, coastal patrol boats open. Oh, um, wow. But the kids got into one of the chase boats. They got into one of the helicopters, which are, oh. the, the helicopters you see doing the rescues yeah, on, yeah. on up in Alaska. Yeah, I've seen those. They are tiny. Oh, they are wow. unbelievably tiny. That's um, so cool. Oh my goodness. And the <laughs> coastal patrol boats, the 87-footers, it is amazing how fast they, uh, they move. Um, it's awesome. Yeah, it is kind of awesome. Thanks <laughs> to all the Coast Guardsmen. We love the opportunity to meet y'all and see the helicopters and boats up yes. close. Thank you for your service. Thank you. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Shannon Morse. We will see you next week on Tech Thing. And if you aren't already a patron. Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> I am a professional. Blooper. You can tell by how sophisticated I am on camera. Yeah, the kids were so excited. <laughs> that sounds fun. It was really cool. They did it out at the Naval Air Station, so it was right next to the Hornet, which oddly Whoa. enough, as it turns out, my dad served on and your... My grandpa. ...served on. That's so funny. It's a cool carry. If you're in the Bay Area, go tour the Hornet. It's awesome. Yeah, that's so cool. It's an aircraft carrier. You 
Diego Mock. I've, I've been on one down in San Diego, and it was awesome. They're it was huge. so cool. Yeah, and they had one of those really, really... <laughs> what is it? The Spruce Goose was an experimental aircraft built by Howard Hughes in World War II. It's like the biggest single airplane ever built. Whoa. And they couldn't get the metal he needed to build it, so they built it out of wood.